by the Chongi calendar. <laughs> Religious calendars are very important. Sometimes their meaning is not obvious at all, and indeed, sometimes it's a bit baffling why we have these calendars. But um, it is by this calendar that we're called to live in remembrance of God. I think, ultimately, because we're forgetful. I'm a religious studies student, and I think one of the central messages of religious tradition is that if you keep doing it over and over again, then eventually you'll get to the sort of the inner core meaning. Um, of course, we're meant to walk in union with God, but one with, oneness with God uh, every, day of, in every day of our lives is not easy. So in celebrating um, things according to the heavenly calendar, um, we put our own heavenly calendar above the secular calendar and restore God to his rightful position in our lives and in our community. As we did last week um, on Monday, we had a wonderful celebration here. And people went ice skating, we went to the holy ground and uh, had a wonderful three-course meal together at a local Spanish restaurant, which was fantastic. Um, yeah, so within holy days, the lesson's worth remembering every year. So this week, we're very lucky. Uh, God is going to deliver us a message through our brother, um, Simon Roselli, who is uh, from our South London community and is also the UK Movement's finance director, uh, which he does voluntarily. Um, he also runs his own health food business and is a magician. Fantastic. Um, I'm sure that uh, God and True Parents will uh, continue to guide us through our own spiritual journeys um, through uh, his, his sermon, which is called Lessons Learnt Along the Way. So before the music ministry come up and lead us in worship, please take a moment to greet those around you, bid them a good morning and a happy Sunday. Hopefully next week there'll be more people to bid. Yes, please move forward. Don't don't be shy. So if you'd like to rise, we can start with our first song. So we're going to combine the first two, uh, Father's Kingdom, then just a closer walk.
again once again, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Good morning. Um, if anyone in the back would like to come fill up the first two rows, lots of space. So let's continue to raise the spirit with our next song. <laughs> come and give Patrick some company. Okay, the next song we're going to sing is the Principal Youth March. Please remain standing on recite family pledge number two. Our family, the owner of Chonoguk, pledges to represent and become central to heaven and earth. By attending God and true parents, we will perfect, perfect the dutiful family way of filial pahans and daughters in our family, patriots in our nation, saints in the world, and divine sons and daughters in heaven and earth. By centering on true love. Please join me in prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we come before you this Sunday morning as brothers and sisters to worship you as our parent. We humble ourselves before your love and mercy to be aware of you. You are as close, as close to us as our own hearts, Heavenly Father, often deep and calm, but sometimes overwhelming, setting, setting our souls afire. This past Friday was Holocaust Memorial Day. We'd like to take this time to commend to you all those around the world who are suffering from persecution and violence, our own lives are often cushioned to the pain and suffering of those in other countries, even those in our own community. We suffer from hardness of heart that numbs us to see how desperately this world is crying out for you. As a community, we'd like to open our hearts and minds to the reality of this broken world that we live in. At the same time, Heavenly Father, we ask you to fill us with your love and mercy to fill us with your everlasting joy. I pray this on behalf of my brothers and sisters here. In my name, Robert Haynes, husband of Christopher Hill, 
a blessed and central couple, aren't you? Please be seated. So, I'm going to read this morning's um, inspiration for the sermon. Uh, this is from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And this is from the Buddha. Uh, no one saves us but ourselves. No one can and no one may. We ourselves must walk the path. And this is from Don Williams. The path of life twists and turns and no two directions are ever the same. Yet our lessons come from the journey, not the destination. Um, I'm sure we'll find out more about that from the sermon. So, um, we move on to the announcements. Um, this Friday, on the 3rd of February, we have Live Lounge uh, here in Lancaster Gate in this very room. Uh, so it's 7 p.m. for 7.30 start. Uh, it's often exciting Lively music from a wide variety of different performers, and I'm sure uh, this week will be no exception. Um, also, uh, next weekend from uh, the 4th to the 5th, that's Saturday um, till Sunday, there's a personal growth workshop with Marjorie Hill, who's a qualified counselor and ther therapist. Um, and um, also this week on Monday, uh, we have, as usual, uh, 10 a.m. prayer meeting at the Hayashi's house on Wednesday, 7 p.m. to 8.30 is Divine Principle Study in the cafe. And um, on Saturday, there's um, 11 till 5 is the One Day Divine Principle Seminar. Uh, it's £10, includes lunch. Please invite your friends. And as usual, uh, on Sunday, we have a service and um, football in Hyde Park. Um, also, we have leftover notebooks from um, God's Day with our Unification Church Symbol on the front, they're available at the reception for one pound, for those of you who'd like one. Um, and uh, yes, I'd also, before um, we continue with the program, Simon Cooper has some words he'd like to share with us. Please welcome him. So good morning, brothers and sisters. I want to just share about a couple of things, or maybe three things. Firstly, just... Uh, I want to show you a little bit about what two parents have been up to, of course, celebrating uh, the holy days that uh, we had last week. Um, and I've got a couple of pictures up here for you to show you. Maybe some of you have seen a lot already online. And I'll send out some more detailed links to you in terms of the different messages that were given by our international president, Hyung Jin Moon, and also the the prayers and other things that were given during that time. I'll send you some more detailed links about that. But uh, I think if you've got a picture there, that's uh, on God's Day in Korea. We were here, of course, having our uh, holy day here, but over in Korea, about eight hours before us, I think, um, True Parents had God's Day at eight o'clock. Pledge service for True Parents' holy birthday, the 45th True God's Day, and also the, it was the 11th anniversary of the coronation of God's kingship that we also celebrated um, at that time. And there was a really heart-moving thank you to True Parents from one of the Ambassadors for Peace who was there. Uh, Ambassador Krishna Rajan of India gave a, a really great uh, little message. And I'll just read you a few lines of it. He said, Father Moon's powerful message of boundless love and unconditional compassion, of service and sacrifice of family values and spiritual leadership is like a lighthouse. Reverend Dr. Samyang Moon is a truly exceptional being. He has walked the surface of the earth for more than nine decades. By his side has been his great and wonderful wife, Dr. Mrs. Huk Jahan Moon. She has given her lifetime to dedication and devotion to her husband as he has pursued, struggled, suffered, and sacrificed for a great and noble cause. The cause of world peace. His concept of one faith is the realization that we are one human family created by God. Living for the sake of others is the only road to real happiness. And he, he went on to share more, saying how um, the best gift that we can give them on their birthday is that we are able to 
really rededicate ourselves to studying their message, to um, uh, their, their message of love and peace, uh, of share, and really practicing the sharing and caring that their message uh, calls us to, to do. And so anyway, I'll send you that as well. And, and then I, I spoke to Peter Sardinger on the phone, our European General Affairs Director, and asked him what other information there was. So I'll be sending you, like I said, some more information. But I did hear unofficially, so this isn't official, uh, but uh, it seems like it's on the cards and quite likely to happen that two parents want to do another tour uh, around Europe. Uh, they're planning apparently for doing that in the spring. And, of course, I said to Peter, so do you know anything, any more details, any particular countries? And he said, no, we don't have the details. But, of course, um, the UK will always be quite high up there on the potential list of countries. So that's something for us to pray about, to reflect about, and to really hopefully be able to look forward to, right? Yeah? And, um, and the next thing I wanted to share with you about a little bit is, oh, should we just go through? That was the, there's our Reverend and Mrs. Song, our European directors of our European movement. Uh, and then this is at the, this is at the lunchtime celebration of True Mother's 70th birthday. They had a lot of people performing, choirs and musicians, and, and they all came over to talk to True Parents and, and just say hello. And that's on the uh, Day of Victory of Love pledge service. So this is remembering, of course, True Parents' uh, son, Hung Jin Moon, who passed to the spirit world when he was just a young teenager, 16 years old. He was in a car crash, and um, actually he died in the car crash, saving the lives of the other young people who were in the car with him, whose lives were saved. And, and then Father offered his uh, sacrifice to God. And, and so every year we have this holy day to remember that sacrifice. Um, I don't know if you remember last year uh, the, the pictures from this holy day when the, the wives of two parents' children who's, who have passed the spirit world, they came up to the front to do a, a ceremony where they ate some of the food at the front uh, together with, with their husbands, who obviously weren't there physically, but there spiritually. And it was watch, quite moving to watch two parents watching their daughter-in-laws uh, of their sons who had already uh, gone to the spirit world. Um, okay, I think that's the last picture. And then the next slide is about... wanted to just share a bit more, because we have about 20 people signed up for this workshop next weekend. And firstly, before you, you sort of get jittery in your seat. One thing <laughs> Mar Marjorie said to me very clearly is that for everyone, you know, people will come to this workshop that we're holding next week when they're ready. So we don't need to uh, over-encourage or push people to come. But nevertheless, um, I very intentionally put this workshop early on in our yearly calendar because I really wanted to give us as a congregation a chance to grow spiritually, to become more aware of, of who we are. And it's, it's actually very much connected to understanding and putting our theology, our divine principle teaching into practice. It's about unpacking our theology, about how God works, comes down and uh, works in people's relationships, uh, how he opens people's hearts. It's about un understanding how to apply our theology in our daily life, in our family life. And... It's really, therefore, a lot to do with getting to know who I am, getting, for you to get to know who you are. So I've got this quote here that I've taken from one of William Haynes' lectures that he took from St. Clement of Alexandria, which is that you need to know, we need to know ourselves. Know yourself. He who knows himself will know God. He who knows God will become like God. So... Of course, in some respects, we search for God outside of ourselves, or through doing certain things. But ultimately, we really um, need to also search for God inside ourselves. And we all 
hear that. Jesus has spoken about that. And, you know, the kingdom of heaven starts within you. And we hear that catchphrase. But actually, what it really, what does that really mean? How much have I, have, I have, or you ever really reflected about what that means? So it's just some of the, the headings for the workshop, the lectures that she's going to give. She's going to give some presentations. And then there'll be some exercises that people can uh, do in pairs. Uh, or no one has to join in anything they don't want to join in. But basically, there'll be some interaction, interactive part. Uh, topics such as mind and body unity. Is it even possible? Uh, moving into alignment. How to change the base in ourselves so as to attract a higher spirit world. The second blessing cannot work without the first blessing. Even though we know the truth, why are we not changing? And another topic, the gift of listening. The gift of listening. And finally, overcoming addictions. If you've ever been addicted to something, like I have, uh, you'll know it's very hard to overcome addictions. Uh, all of us have probably some sort of addiction in our life. Uh, it may not be one of the typical ones that people talk about, but most of us have things that uh, we rely upon that aren't always healthy. And... and you know, finding a way to overcome that is a very liberating experience. It opens up a chance for God to come into your life more. So, the, again, just some people ask me about the program. Uh, on Saturday, it will start from 9 till 5. On Sunday, it will start with Sunday service at 11 o'clock. Uh, and it will finish slightly later than the Saturday at 6 p.m. So, again, just wanted to share that with you. And you know, please feel free to talk to me or... Our assistant pastor, Mr. Hayashi, if you have any more questions about it, uh, and yeah, we'd be happy to talk. Okay, so I'm going to invite the band back up now to sing two more songs uh, to prepare for our sermon. And I, I just want to say that you know these songs that we're going to sing now are very powerful songs. They've got really incredible lyrics to them. So I just want to remind us that this is our chance to worship God to speak to him as we sing these songs. So let's do that together and, and feel God's Holy Spirit in this room with us, with the band, with one another, and uh, with God being here in this room together. So let's stand and invite the band back up. Thank you.
going to sing is The Hand That Holds the World. So good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Um, so yeah, this is a, the title of this sermon is Lessons Learned Along the Way. Um, if I was going to give this sermon about lessons learned away along the way since my childhood, 
It'd be a very long sermon. <laughs> but one very, very good lesson I learned very uh, early on in life when I was about seven years old was to never eat yellow snow. Someone got it. Right, okay. Uh, I lived in the countryside <laughs> and there was yellow snow occasionally. Uh, if this was a, a lesson uh, learned along the way since I had met this movement, I should also be very long. And uh, one lesson that I can honestly say probably is the longer I've been here, the less I understand. But that's another lesson. Um, if this was a lesson uh, learned along the way since I started my family, it would also be very long, also be very complicated. But actually one lesson that I can re- on a, ho- honestly say that helps is... Uh, When you're having a conversation with your spouse, at least pretend you're listening. So go, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, okay, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Even when you're not listening, just pretend. It it, it helps a lot. Uh, But actually, uh, this is actually just a lesson from one week in my life. Um, I believe you can learn lessons from everyone and everything. And this is just from one week in my life that I want to share with you. Um, from some of the songs, you probably noticed that uh, there was a theme, just a closer walk with the I'm on my way, Principal Youth March. Um, anyway, it's all about a journey, uh, and I think we're all on that journey. So actually, I'm going to share some lessons, like say, from this week in my life when I was actually walking the Pilgrim's Way. Uh, and for those of you that don't know uh, what the Pilgrim's Way is, it's, it's, it's a journey that the old pilgrims used to make from Canterbury, uh, from Winchester to Canterbury cathedrals. And it's basically about 140 miles. Uh, and they used to make this, and they used to stop at various churches along the way. And I can honestly say that during that journey, I probably didn't have like an epiphany on the road to Damascus like, uh, like Paul. Uh, the heavens didn't open. I didn't suddenly feel, you know, God speaking to me. But like I say, you can learn something from everyone uh, and everything. And some of these are just some of the, some of the lessons that I learned. We did it basically, uh, I did it with one brother, uh, Ashley Crosswaite, and also partly with Franklin Fortune. But basically we decided to, do, uh, to raise money uh, for two things. One was for Lancaster Gate, the facade outside. The other thing that we were doing it for was the Destiny Junior School in Uganda. And actually when we, des- when we set off, we decided that actually... We didn't really have a plan as such. We would just rely on people's goodwill to let us sleep in their barn. Uh, if we found a farmer and say, can we sleep in your barn? We're on this journey and we're doing it for this. Can we, you know, have a, you know, or in an outhouse. And if worse came to the worst, you know, we'd just sleep under the trees. Uh, and that's how we would do it. We'd just rely on, you know, that was basically like our plan. Anyway, like I say, normally you don't really come up with a plan like that uh, or an idea like that unless you're kind of drunk in a pub uh, one night and you've probably had one or two many drinks. But actually, I can't really say that as neither of us drink and uh, neither of us are in a pub. I can't give that as a reason to why I signed up to this plan. Um, but actually, before I start, um, I'm just going to uh, play a game with you. It's called Name... Does anyone remember that? that... No, no, not a magic trick. Uh, does anyone remember that uh, program called Name That Tune? Yeah, yeah. yeah you remember that tune. So I'm going to play a tune for you, hopefully... Um, and actually, I've got money for you. The first one that can name the tune, they get to have five pounds, right? Okay? So, right, right, I, hope, right. I, I, I don't know if I should give it to you for safekeeping, Damon, but actually, I'll keep it there for safekeeping there. And I've got a twist. There's a twist to it, right? So I want you to hold the twist, and I'll explain what the twist is later. Now, you only get one guess, right? So I'm going to put this on. And if you, if you guess what it is, put your hand up, I'll stop the music, you can have your guess. If you're wrong, we keep going, right? So it's like one chance and one chance only, so don't put your hand up too quickly, right? But obviously put it up before everybody else, otherwise you're, you're not, not going to win the five pounds, are you? Right, okay. So if you know what it is, just put your hand up. I'll help you, it's from a film. Correct. Huh? Uh, uh, wait a minute, I'll leave it, I'll leave it for a bit more. Right.
Yeah. Now, George, the twist, right? Oh, dear. Huh? There's a name in that envelope, George. If your name is in it, right, you have to give £20 to the, uh, to the pot. Right? You lose your £5, uh, and you have to take, you lose £20 as well. Or you can just keep, uh, you know, so do you, wanna, do you, do you just want to lose the £5 and just forget about it? Uh, or open the envelope and, and risk losing £20 of your own money into the pot? You could lose twenty pounds, or you take the twist. Go on, make it exciting, George. Gamble. I'm losing. <laughs> <laughs> what do you reckon, George? George, I'll go half with you. I oh, know. <laughs> huh? What do you reckon, George? Right? Go for it, George. Go on, over. Go on. Uh, I was wrong. Uh, five pounds to George. Huh? I thought I was Simon Cooper's name. Anyway, why I play that tune? Huh? Have you ever had a, have you ever had a tune that gets into your head that you just cannot get rid of? Even if you don't like that tune, I actually, I don't mind that tune actually, I quite like that tune. But sometimes you get a tune in your head and you just cannot get rid of it. Uh, and I remember watching a program one time about this guy that was, he was climbing this mountain and he fell off the mountain and he broke both his legs. Um, and he'd fallen 40 feet, he'd smashed both his ankles and basically he was going to die on the mountain because nobody knew that he was there. And he had to drag himself off the mountain using, like, his arms. Uh, and he dragged himself. And then he had to go over this kind of glacier field, which was all these boulders. And he kept passing out. And he said the one song that was in his mind when he was doing this and he was passing out was Brown Girl in the Ring. Who remembers that one? Yeah, yeah? Bo yeah Boney M, right? Brown Girl in the Ring. And he said he just had to get off that mountain because he was going to really regret dying with these wongs, <laughs> with the words of Boney M, of brown girl in the ring going through his head. That would be the last thing that he would think of before he died. Anyway, so that song, it, it, it came a lot to me while we were on this journey. Why, uh, Blues Brothers? What were they on, George? What were the Blues Brothers on? Do you remember what they were on? They were fundraising, but they were on a mission... They were on a mission from God, right? And what, basically, at the end of it, they're in this, they're in, in this car. They're, uh, they're, trying to get, uh, to, uh, they're trying to get back to Chicago to save the orphanage. And I think they're in this car, and they go, it's 150 miles to Chicago. We've got half a tank of gas, a, a tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark. We're wearing sunglasses. And then the other one goes, hit it. And, and they set off. Anyway... Like I say, in one sense, we were on this kind of mission from God. And I was with Ashley, and it was like the brothers, and we were off. Anyway, like I say, some of these uh, are lessons that I learned along the way. Um, and hopefully, some of them you can get something from. There's about 15 or 20 of them. Anyway, and as I go through them, I'll kind of go through it. But actually, one thing that I can say before I share any of these lessons is actually, we actually achieved an incredible amount even before we set off. There's nothing like a deadline to focus your mind, right? Because actually, Ashley had been talking about, oh, let's get this website together, and they bought this domain name. And for two years, they had this website. But actually, it wasn't visible, right? There was nothing on it. There, just, there was nothing, and someone else had the password, and nothing happened. Also, Ashley was talking, yeah, I'm going to get some leaflets made, and, you know, and, you know, years went by. And all Ashley was talking about was this Destiny Junior School in, in Uganda, but actually, he didn't have anything to show from it. He had no website, he had no leaflets. But suddenly, because we had this deadline, deadlines are good, actually, right? Because they focus the mind. If you've got an exam, right, uh, you suddenly focus your mind. If you've got an essay to hand in, you suddenly it focuses your mind. You've just remembered a deadline, right, Simon? No, I promised to give Ashley some money. Oh, right, okay, right, okay, right, okay. So, anyway, deadlines help. For, so, actually, before we set off, suddenly, we had, within the last week, we'd got some leaflets, we'd got the website up and running, we kind of signed up to kind of uh, uh, just giving, all these kind of different things. So actually, even before we set off, a lot of things had taken place. 
Anyway, the first lesson um, I can share with you is actually have a good map and follow the, uh, follow the directions and then you will end up at the destination. So actually beforehand, we, before we left, we had bought three maps. Uh, I'd done some research, I'd gone on, I bought some maps and actually without the maps we'd never even got out of Winchester. Uh, it was so complicated. We were suddenly at Winchester Cathedral and it's like, which way? But anyway, the maps were, in one sense, they were quite clear. They say walk across the courtyard, follow, and then there were these little, not only were the, there were directions on the maps, but there were markers. And the, the markers were about that big, and they were green with an arrow on it. And they would point forward to the left or the right, and we would follow these markers. And actually, sometimes we missed uh, the markers. Uh, so sometimes we'd end up going in the wrong direction, and you'd kind of walk around, and you're kind of searching for these things. But eventually you'd find another marker, and then, or you had to backtrack, and eventually you'd end up, you know, back on the trail again. So anyway, like I say, if I think about it, in our spiritual lives, we also have a map, right? We have the divine principle, right? On another level, we have also these markers and signs, which I could kind of say they're like Father's words, and we also have a destination, which is God, right? So if we use the map, if we follow the markers, we will end up at our destination. But obviously, if we don't follow them, or we miss them, we'll start to go off in the wrong direction. And then sometimes you end up searching, you start going around and around and around at the same place, but you don't really move on along your journey, because you're still looking, or you haven't learned, you know, you've got to keep finding the next marker, set of markers, and moving on. So anyway, that was the first lesson, all right? That was lesson number one. So number two was, um, be prepared and do your research before you set off. So in one sense, yeah, we had the maps, uh, but that was about all the preparations that we did. Um, we didn't really do any long walks beforehand. Uh, Ashley was like, yeah, yeah, I'm fit, you know, I am in the garden all day, and I, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm up for it, and it won't be a problem. And I walked the dogs for 15 minutes in the morning, and I said, yeah, yeah, it's, it won't be a problem, you know, it'd be not a problem. And actually, I realized that actually it was going to be slightly more than walking the dogs. Uh, so actually, about the last few weeks, I started to walk them half an hour in the morning and half an hour in the evening. That was my preparation. Anyway, it was a kind of a little bit of uh, too little, too late, I, is the only thing that comes to mind. And, it, and sometimes, I mean, we have that in life as well, it's too little, too late. So if you've got exams, you know, and we think, yeah, I'll do it next week, uh, and eventually it's too little, too late. Uh, so anyway, that was, what, you know, like I say, do your preparation well in advance. Also, we had no idea, you know, really what we were doing. Uh, I mean, we were talking, Ashley was saying, yeah, yeah, I, I've asked Susan and uh, Melanie to join us in, Win in Canterbury. You know, if we're going to do 20 miles a day, that's seven days. We'll be in Winchester on Sunday evening. And then Melanie, we can have this great big meal together, family meal. And then I said, yeah, but actually, I, actually I've got to be in, on, back in London on, fr on Saturday. So I can actually be with you for the first five days and... And then he goes, oh, well, that's no problem. You know, we'll just do 30 miles a day, you know. So <laughs> we do 30 miles a day for five days. That's 150 miles. And I'm like, yeah, Ashley, but I don't think you understand. You know, oh, no, it'd be no problem, you know. And actually, like you say, you know, he started talking about, yeah, let's meet, you know, on Friday evening with Susan and Melanie. Um, also, there was something that we found out along the way called a thousand mile socks. Has anyone ever heard of a thousand mile socks? And if you walk, all walkers know about 1,000-mile socks. Uh, you find out after you set off, of course. But anyway, they're socks within a sock. And so actually they rub like that. The sock rubs against each other, but it doesn't rub against your foot. Uh, but like I say, anyway, we found out too late. Uh, we found out after we'd set off, and it was a bit too late at that point. And then anyway, I remember also Tim Reed, you know, he said, oh, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've got the web feed up and everything like that, so just send me uh, pictures you know, and I, I said, yeah, okay, I can do that. And he said, I'm particularly interested in when you get your blisters. You know, put your blisters up there. And we can I put that on the website. And I'm like, what are you talking about, blisters? I mean, you know, we're just going for a walk. That's what we're doing. What are you talking about, blisters? And the other thing that we hadn't really thought about was actually we had to carry something too. We hadn't thought about that at all. And actually, even though our backpacks were very kind of like minimalistic. Uh, they were light. We didn't even take a tent because we thought that will just add to our weight. So actually, you know, we just had basically very little in there, but it was still 10 to 15 kilos, each of our backpacks. 
And actually, when you start walking all day, every day, with 10, 15 kilos on your back, it starts to kind of cut in, right? And then we hadn't packed, you know, thought about that at all. And actually, like I say, partly because of the dew, uh, on the first day we walked through these meadows and our feet got wet. And then, of course, it's like being in a bath all day, every day, you know, and then you, you get out and they're, they're all kind of nice and soft and things like that. So our feet became like that. And actually, after seven miles, seven miles into a 140-mile journey, we got our first blister there, right? <laughs> and it's not really helpful when you think I've got another 133 miles to go uh, and I've got my first blister. Anyway, that was at the end of the first evening. <laughs> anyway, uh, his feet were just covered in these blisters, uh, just completely covered. So anyway, before you set off uh, on your journey, do your research. Okay, next, next slide, please. Uh, the next one I would say is keep moving, right? Normally, um, after a couple of hours, we'd kind of sit down for a couple of, you know, a biscuit, a cup of tea. And actually, we'd only sit down for maybe about 10 minutes. And we'd have a bit of a chat, and then we'd keep going again. But as the day went on, every time you stopped, it became harder and harder to keep going, to get going again. And I remember, actually, my spiritual mother, she called me from Australia uh, before I left. And she said, you know, if you do stop for five, ten minutes and you do rest, make sure you do exercises before you set off again. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, what do you mean? It's just a walk. Yeah? But actually, once you stop, everything starts to kind of close up and, and stiffen up and tighten up. And actually, when you start off, especially after lunch, when you sit down for five to ten minutes, it becomes incredibly painful and everything's stiff, everything's tight. And actually, until you've warmed up again. And actually, it's the same, and I realize it's the same in our spiritual life. Sometimes, you know, we think, yeah, I'm going to take a break. Uh, or I'm going to take a, you know, I'm going to actually stop for a while now. And actually, once we stop, it's actually harder to then start again. So actually, with our spiritual lives too, we need to keep moving. We shouldn't kind of just stop and think, well, I'm just going to rest for, you know, this year or this month or this week or whatever. It's actually keep going, right? And then actually it makes the whole journey a more, you know, there's a transition. It's easier. So keep moving. Okay, next slide. Uh, do something enough times and long enough and it will become a habit. So actually by the fourth or fifth day, actually everything seemed to be kind of, you know, the... the fixing and working. Uh, it, didn't, it wasn't so painful when we started walking in the morning. The backpack, it was lighter. It wasn't kind of cutting in, you know, like the tent is like this when we put it on. And actually, it became a way of life. You get up, uh, you have breakfast, or, you know, if it was under the trees, we had a cup of tea and some biscuits, and then you walk. And then you walk all day, and then you sleep, and then the next day you get up and you walk. And actually, it became... It wasn't, in the end, after about the fourth or fifth day, it was no longer a burden. The first four or five days was a real challenge, and it was a real burden. But actually, it just became a habit. And once it became a habit, you start to think of all the positive things. So, for example, you know, I started to think as we were walking along, actually, it's very pleasant out here. You know, we're out in nature, it's peaceful, it's quiet, there's beautiful countryside... There's birds, there's bees, you know, it's tranquil. You know, back in London, in my house, I've got screaming kids. They're fighting with each other, you know. I've got a wife that's nagging me, do this, do that. Can you do this, darling? Oh, can you do that? And actually, you know, you've got no responsibilities. When you're out there, you just walk. That's it. You just walk. It's nice, right? You don't have to pay any bills, you know. Like I say, it's just, like I say, it becomes a, very much like a way of life. And actually, I started to think as we were walking, and I started to think of, like, Forrest Gump. And I thought, why stop in Canterbury? You know, this is quite nice. Why not just keep going to Dover? And, <laughs> and actually, I had serious things. I started to think about it. Uh, actually, why stop in Dover? This is really enjoyable. Why not just keep going to Rome? I mean, that's the original pilgrimage, right? The Campo, there's, there's a name for it. Campo de something. And actually... It's about two and a half thousand miles. I started, actually, I talked to somebody about doing it. And actually, I worked out, if it's two and a half thousand miles, it would take me about six months. And, yeah, it would be an incredible adventure. Of course, you know, you know uh, there'd be ups and downs. But, it, you know, you'd be on the road. And I honestly, I can hand on my heart, I can honestly say I would do it. 
If I didn't have kids, if I didn't have bills, if I didn't have a wife, if I didn't have things that kind of tied me down, I would just do it. Uh, just for the adventure. Uh, it, it was just such an incredible thing. But anyway, like I say, if you do something long enough, it becomes like this habit. So a bit like hundoke. Or, or on a spiritual level, like, you know, like our, if we start a bowing condition. You know, to begin with, actually, it's challenging, right? But if you do it enough times, it just becomes a habit. Uh, and it becomes kind of like a way of life. Witnessing, same thing, right? To begin with, actually, it's challenging, right? But if you do it and it just becomes your way of life, then it's just normal. So like I say, do things, do these spiritual things long enough, uh, and ha- you know, uh, enough times, and actually it won't be a challenge anymore for you. Okay, next slide. So God works in mysterious ways. So yeah, basically... When we set off, we had this plan. Yeah, we're going to walk together the whole way and, you know, we're, you know, we'll be together and this is how we'll do. We'll walk a little bit to here and to here and to here. But actually, things never kind of turn out the way you imagine them to, right? So actually, after the first day, Ashley's feet were so bad, he ended up in, uh, he actually ended up going to the local hospital, um, in one hospital, and he had to talk to the district nurse. Anyway, while he was getting his feet taken care of, um, I was walking, um, and then he had to catch. He took a bus to catch me up to where I was. But anyway, when he was on the bus, uh, he was talking to somebody that was sitting next to him in the bus, and the guy was talking to him about where he'd been and why he was hobbling, and he started explaining about his blisters and why he was doing it. And he started talking about the Destiny Junior School, and he was saying it was in Uganda. And the guy goes, "Oh, I'm from Uganda." Uh, and I actually said, oh, that's really good. Uh, whereabouts? And so he said, and then he said, oh, where's the Destiny Junior School? And Ashley said, and he gave him, he said, oh, that's on the same street I grew up on. Uh, the same street I grew up on. And he said, actually, I want to help you. Actually, no, give me five of your leaflets. Give me five of your leaflets because I'll find five friends to sponsor you. Um, so like I say, sometimes if Ashley hadn't have had his blisters, he'd have never met this person. Also, another time, uh, we, were in, uh, we were somewhere in Dorking, I think it was, and because, again, because of his feet, we, met, we, we ran into this uh, Christian person. He was a kind of a minister at one stage. Uh, it was in Westerham. And again, he sponsored us, and actually, actually he's been in contact with him a lot of times since he's been back. So like I say, sometimes we have this plan, and we think it's going to go like this, but sometimes God has kind of other ideas. And actually, when, you know, things don't go to plan, you have to kind of look out for the opportunities that maybe God is using for us on that way. So like I say, God works for us in mysterious ways. This is someone else that was sponsoring us up uh, uh, along the way. Okay, next picture, please. So get out in nature. Um, For me, actually, when I grew up, I didn't really, actually, in one sense, I didn't really believe in God as such. God was kind of like my nature. I used to kind of ride, I used to kind of swim in the river, I used to go for walks with the dogs. So for me, being out in nature was, was really easy for me to do. But actually, at one point we got to this place, and it talked about, there was this kind of signboard, and it talked about how many hours a day children used to spend in nature, and, you know, in 1930 or 1950, 1970, and then how many hours a day children of today, they spend in nature. And he was talking about how they spend, basically, they're on their Xbox or or everything else. And actually, their imagination, because of that, they don't imagine, right? They just, it's a screen, and there's no imagination there. So anyway, we're talking about it. Anyway, we started talking about these, uh, suddenly we were walking past all these pillboxes. And these pillboxes were the last line of defense built in the last war. Anyway, we were talking, you know, we started going back to our childhood. And we started talking about reading the, the Victor comics. We read the Victor comics here, right? <laughs> and we used to read these Victor comics, and then we started talking about them and uh, what was happening, and then we were kind of, almost we kind of, we kind of descended into children, actually, again. And we were kind of in these pillboxes with our kind of like Tommy guns and, you know, with these pieces of wood, and we were kind of fighting off the enemy. And, but actually, like I say, in one sense, we should get out in nature. You know, it talks about in the divine principle that, you know, uh, that's where God is. We can see God through nature. So actually, uh, this is the top left-hand picture. That was the first day we went uh, coming out of Canterbury, uh, Winchester Cathedral. Uh, there were some deer in the first field that we walked into. And this was the most, you can't really see it here, but it was the most incredible double rainbow that I've ever seen in the whole of my life. We, I was walking up some hill uh, near West Ham, and I suddenly it's, this huge shower came, and there was this double rainbow. 
And I was desperate to get out of the woods so that I could take a picture of it. And by the time, actually, I almost got out of it, there was only a kind of a tiny bit left. But it was the most incredible, you know, double rainbow I think I've ever seen in my life. This is top right is actually one of our campfires where we slept under the trees. We had about two or three nights under the trees where we couldn't find other places. And there was this owl above us in the tree. And it was like, woo, woo. All night, it was like, woo. And then there was a peewit in the morning. And then there were deer coming through the camp. And so it's really good, actually, to get out uh, into nature. And then this other place, that's, uh, Franklin was with us at that point, And he said that's, uh, he's going to buy that place as his like, uh, holiday home. Uh, he just saw this little pad along the way. And he thought that would be a nice place to kind of retire to uh, so along the way. So that's the bottom picture there. I think it was designed, actually, by Capability Brown. Uh, OK, next slide, please. So, next one is God provides. So, yeah, God provides food and help. Um, so, actually, wherever we went, there was so much food for us along the way. Um, there were, we, we, I mean, this was an apple tree. We found hundreds of apple trees, thousands of apples. I've never eaten so many apples in my life. But anyway, there were also there were pear trees. There were blackberries in the, in the, in the bushes. Yew berries. Actually, was really into these yew berries, right? Uh, uh, churchyards have these yew, and you can eat the berry. You mustn't eat the seed. The seed is really poisonous, but you can eat the yew, right, the berry bit. Uh, uh, we found uh, beech nuts. Uh, we were eating beech nuts at one point, walnuts, chestnuts, watercress, damsons. There was so much along the way. But also, apart from just food, actually, there were other ways that kind of God was kind of helping us in different ways. At one point, I say, Ashley was on this bus to Westerham, and I had to meet him. And I'd done about 20 miles that day, and I'd also gone over about seven peaks. And I was kind of exhausted. And, I, and he said, oh, yeah, I'm down in Westerham, just, you know. And I was looking at it, and I was trying to work it out, and I thought it's about another two and a half miles for me off my track to get down to this place to meet up with him again. And really, when I thought, when I get to this point where I have to try, I don't really think I can actually walk this two and a half miles. It's just completely off my beat. Anyway, I was walking up through the woods, kind of struggling with this point, and then suddenly I met this really, well, there were about a 60-year-old couple walking up through the woods, and they were kind of like, they were, obviously, they were lost. And I said, you know, actually, I, you know, I said, can I help? I said, I don't really know where I'm going myself, but maybe I can help. I've got a map, at least. And they said, oh, we're trying to get back to the car park. And I said, well, on my map, according to this, if we keep going up here and we take a left, then we'll come to the car park. And I said, I'm going there anyway, so, you know, we can walk together. So we started walking together, and then we, I was asking them, and they started talking to me about who they were. And basically, this man had lost his wife uh, about three or four years before. He was about 60-year-old. And he said this is kind of like, he, uh, basically, he was courting this lady. And he had taken them out into the woods, because that's where he'd kind of grown up. Anyway, he started talking. He actually lived in Purley. And anyway, he asked me then what I was doing, and I explained. And then I explained that I had to go to kind of West Ham. He said, oh, I'll give you a lift. You know, I'll jump in the car. You know, I'll give you a lift down there. So I was so grateful for that person at that moment. And then also when I met Ashley afterwards, and then the next day I, I thought, well, I've got to get back. It's going to take me two and a half miles to get back to that point. But there was again somebody. He said, oh, no, it's all right. I'll run you up there. Uh, I'll give you a lift to where you were. So sometimes, like I say, God is providing for us. Actually, sometimes we don't really see it. But actually, there are, there are things that God is doing for us in our lives. It's just we need to kind of look, for it, look out for it. Um, next one. We're all on the way. Um, so, okay, this was, this was my journey on one sense for one week. But actually, we're all on a journey, you know, going back to God. We're all, in a, in a sense, we're going back to becoming this child of God. And on that journey, obviously, we're all going to face various trials. Um, there are going to be tribulations. There's going to be hills. There's going to be valleys. Um, but the worst thing you can do is actually stop, sit down, and give up. Because if you stop, sit down, and give up, you'll never get to your destination. So another, I'd just like to read at this point some other words from Buddha. He said, there are only two mistakes one can make along the road to truth. The first is not going all the way. And the second is not starting. So there are only two mistakes one can make along the road to truth. One is not going all the way, and, num and the second is not starting. So like I say, the worst part for me was this journey. Actually, I had to do by myself. Like, uh, it was about 20 miles from Dorking to Westerham. 
And like I say, it's hard going up the hills, but almost it's worse coming down because it's kind of always on your legs. But more than that, you realize every step you go down, eventually you're going to have to start going back up again on the next one and you're losing ground. And actually, in one sense, like I say, our spiritual life's the same. You know, there's going to be hills, there's going to be, you know, we're going to go back down to the valleys, there's going to be another hill, there's going to be trials and tribulations. And like I say, there are going to be ups and downs. It's easy when we're on the top. When we were walking on the top of these hills and you could see everything below you and it was flat, it's easy. And that's the same with our spiritual lives. When we're walking along the top with our blessings going well, it's easy. But like I say, at one point, Ashley's feet were so bad, he was like, all he could think of, but he was behind us, he was just like, one more step. One more step, one more step. And eventually we got to that point uh, that we were trying to get to that day. So like I say, sometimes we try and set these incredible targets, right, for the year. But actually, it's, sometimes it's good to break it down into smaller targets. So this week I'm going to try and accomplish this. This week I'm going to, or, or, or today I'm going to accomplish this. Tomorrow I'm going to, and then we'll make a, a week's goal. And then a week's goal, become, uh, we do it week by week, we make a month goal. And a month goal becomes a year goal. So actually, like I say, we're all on that journey. And we, you know, like I say, in one sense, we start off at different places. Uh, sometimes we go different routes, different paths. But we're all on that journey together. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Also, the other thing I realized, we're all different. Uh, so just as on our spiritual journey, you know, we're starting sometimes at different places on that journey. Some of us start closer, some of us start further behind. Some of us have more baggage, some of us have left less baggage. Sometimes, like I say, we have to go different routes. But we have, and we have to overcome different things. We also, we go at different speeds. I realized that as well. And actually, like I say, uh, you know, in life, it's the same. So actually, like I say, at one point, there was, uh, at the beginning, there were, there were three of us. So Franklin was there, Ashley was there, and myself was there. And Franklin was very much of the mind of, like, in the morning, okay, let's get up, let's go. Let's uh, have a cup of tea, and we'll go. Let's walk, let's go, let's go. Very much like that. And he wanted to stop for nothing. Ashley is completely different. Ashley's like, oh, I just want to have another cup of tea before I set off. Oh, I just want to enjoy it. I just want to kind of take it in. I don't just don't want to just do the walk. I just want to experience it. Oh, Look at that picture. Look at that swan over there. Oh, I need to take a picture of the swan. Oh, there's a beautiful flower. I've got to smell that one. Oh, look at that garden over there. Oh, that's a really nice garden. I'll take a picture of that. And I was like, if you look at Ashley's camera, 90% of his pictures would be of flowers and of birds and bees and the creation. And it was like, you know... And Franklin's like hopping on the spot. He's like muttering. He's like, oh my goodness, my goodness, I can't believe this. I can't believe it. We've got to go to, we've got to, go to Canterbury. And he's smelling the flowers. I, and, now, and now, I can't believe it. He's, he's looking at the swan. I mean, you could look at the swan in the park, for goodness sake. But we've got to go to Canterbury, right? But Ashley is like, ah. Oh. Uh, but for me, it's like, I was kind of, I was, to be honest, I was a bit more in Franklin's side of the thing. I was a bit more, we've got to keep going. But also I realized there have to be a bridge. You know, in one sense I was trying to slow Ashley, I mean I was trying to slow Franklin down, but also speed Ashley up. Uh, and this was like, at this place here, this was a watercress farm. Uh, and this was, this is the, they had these acres of this watercress growing. And it was, a, it was a farm of watercress. But again, Ashley's here, he's like, oh, I've got to taste it. You know, so he's sitting down and he's talking. In the corner up there, <laughs> Franklin's still going, you know. He wasn't stopping. So like I say, you know, we are all different. Uh, and it's good to appreciate each other's differences, right, and accept us, you know, each other for who we are. Another thing I realized, actually, you look at differences, is actually what we packed. Uh, in our pa- if you'd taken all our backpacks out and you'd put them on the floor, you would have seen how different we were. I mean, mine, I had just a change of clothes. I had a toothbrush, some shaving stuff. Uh, uh, a, uh, a jacket and, and very little else and of course water and other things and a bit of food but Ashley's was like double the size and I'm like what you got in there and he goes well I've got you know the billy can and I've got uh, this and that and he said the worst thing was the most weird and wonderful thing in his backpack was he took it out and said I brought my snorkel <laughs> 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 and I'm like but 
well, we're going on a walk, you know. What have you bought a snorkel for on the walk? You know, what's that going to do for you? Well, you know, this is October. You've got to imagine it's cold, you know, it's October. He goes, well, I might find a river or a bog to snorkel in. And I'm like, yeah, but we won't have time for that. You know, he goes, no, but I like bog snorkeling. Anyway, needless to say, his bog snorkel never got used. <laughs> and eventually, after a few days, we, met, we were at someone's house and he left half his stuff because he realized it was just unnecessary. But anyway, like I say, we are all different and we need to kind of appreciate, you know, each other's differences. Um, next slide. So actually, the joy of companionship. Um, actually, in this photo, we're kind of all smiles and, and friendly faces because actually that, we hadn't even set off. Uh, <laughs> that was the night before, and it was still like the big adventure. We didn't really know what was going to happen. And it was like, I'm sure it was like war. Actually, when they set off to war, they were all, yeah, yeah it's going to be fun, and it's going to be a jolly thing. And actually, after day one, it wasn't fun, you know. And it, it, it certainly wasn't like the picture. It wouldn't have been the same the next night. But actually, the relationships are really important. Um, there's a saying we have in England, like, a friend in need is a friend indeed. And actually, what is a friend? And I read this awful, awful article in Facebook, uh, on, in a newspaper the other day about this, this person that she, she was so proud that she had a thousand Facebook friends. Does anyone have over a thousand Facebook friends? Oh, one, one, nearly over there and one, right, okay. Right, anyway, she was so proud, you know, it's like some kind of competition, I've got a thousand friends on Facebook. I, I have a Facebook site, I have to say, and I get all these requests, be my friend, be, and I've got about 200 pending. Uh, and one person, actually, they wrote to me the other day, and they said, boy, I sent you this thing, you know, you never responded. Well, who are you, you know? And I said, well, I haven't responded to the 200 other people also that are pending to be on my Facebook. But anyway, this woman, she was so proud that she had a 1,000 friends on Facebook. And then actually, she kind of struggled, and she went through some difficulties, and then she wrote a message on Facebook. Tonight, I'm going to end it all. I've had enough of life. I'm going to commit suicide. Um, goodbye to, and thank you, you know, for all those out there that have known me. Goodbye. And actually, when they found her computer the next day, um, some people had written back to her. Uh, but what they'd written back was like, tell me what it's like when you're hanging on the rope. Uh, tell me what it's like when you're on the other side. Send me a message when you get, you know, from the other side, like Houdini, type, that kind of thing. Not one person actually tried to talk her out of it. Not one person knocked on her door. Not one person called her up and said, can I talk to you? Let's go for a cup of coffee. So what, are, is that a friend? No. Uh, so actually, relationships are important. So actually, on that journey, we had so much time with each other, because we were with each other basically all day, every day. And actually, it's really good. We could talk about everything. We could talk about our childhood. We could talk about, our, you know, since we joined the movement, you know, different things, our ups and downs, politics, sports, blessings, whatever. And actually, it's really good to have a healthy relationship. Uh, we talk about friends of faith in this movement, right? And actually, it's really good to have friends of faith, someone that you can really share everything and let it all out, but not actually feel judged for doing so. Because it might not be positive. It might be negative. And actually, like I say, you know, sometimes it's good to get things out. It's good to kind of get your frustration out or, you know, uh, you know you're, you're having a hard time with something. And it's good to let it all out sometimes. Uh, a problem shared is a problem halved, right? Out of the three of us, and I won't give, their, I won't give you an answer, who do you think could get most of it, his frustration, <laughs> out on the journey? You. I won't say. I won't say. <laughs> I'll leave it to your imagination. Uh, next lesson. I'm not saying. Uh, I've started, so I'll finish. So originally I said to Ashley, I said, I can only do five days. Because I, I had a commitment on, uh, and a commitment in the school on a Monday. And I had a commitment on, on, uh, for something on a Sunday. So I said, I've got to finish, uh, you know, after five days. That's all I can do for this thing. But actually, after five days, it was so difficult for me to leave. Even though I'd, I'd said at the beginning that was my commitment, after five days, I really felt I don't want to go. Uh, I don't want to kind of leave this as like unfinished business. And so I said to Ashley, I said, when I finish this thing on Monday that I've got to do, I'm coming back. 
Um, because it, otherwise it's just going to kind of eat away at me uh, and it's going to gnaw at me. It's going to be kind of unfinished business. And then actually Franklin also, he had to go because there was a workshop in Germany. When anyway, I called him up on Monday evening, I said, Franklin, I'm going back out. Um, if you want to come, I'll, I'll come with you. Uh, do you want to come if you come, come with me? Anyway, so he said, yeah, I, I, definitely, I want to come. So actually we, we, we drove down and we caught up with Ashley and then we kind of completed the thing together. But also it's the same in our spiritual lives. You know, if we start something and you don't finish it, there's this unfulfillment there. And actually, it's good to finish things. If you start something, see it through to the end. Don't just kind of stop halfway or three-quarters of the way or even 95% of the way. Because actually, you won't feel like... You, you, it's just not finished. There's unfinished business. And it will eat away at you. Right? And there's so much satisfaction is actually in finishing and, and completing something. So if you start something, finish it. Okay, next one. This is for you, Damon. Uh, listen to your parents. Uh, <laughs> actually, or to all of us. Uh, actually, sometimes, you know, all of us, we probably think at some point in our lives that we know better than our parents. Um, but actually, they've probably been there before us. They've had the experiences. Why do, why do tribes have these elders? Because actually, of all their experiences, and we can, they've been through those, those troubles or those difficulties... And actually, we can learn from those. I mean, actually, when you become parents for the first time, actually, you know nothing, right? It's like, what do I do now? But actually, the first person, in one sense, you should be going to is people that have had that experience, like your parents, for example. And actually, but sometimes we get to a point, especially I went through, in, like, a rebellious period, probably all do. And I remember saying something to my father. Uh, he said something to me, and I said something back. And then eventually I said, uh, um, I said anyway, you're old-fashioned, uh, and he said to me, he looked to me and he said, you know, you think you've hurt me with that, don't you? You think that's kind of like, you know, I'm old-fashioned. But actually, he said, that's a, that's a compliment for me. Uh, and it was just like all my power uh, was just like kai, ki aikido. It's just gone. I couldn't argue with that. But actually, our parents and our elders, they've been through certain experiences. They know certain things. Anyway, I called him up, my father, before I left, and I, we were talking about him, certain things, and I talked, I said, I'm off tomorrow. And he said, whatever you do, uh, do two things before you leave. One is to get something called compete. Uh, and I was like, what's that? And he said, well, when you walk, it's like a, it's like a plaster, but it's, it's not a plaster, it's like a second skin, and it goes over your feet. And actually, you will suffer with your feet. Uh, and this will, it won't get rid of the blister, but it will stop it rubbing on the blister. And he said, the other thing you have to do is take a good walking stick with you. And anyway, again, I thought, you know, something made me partially listen. And anyway, I went to an all-night chemist, and I found these compies. And I didn't really know what they were. They were quite expensive. But anyway, I bought them, and I put them in my backpack. By the end of day one, they were all over my feet. And I was so grateful, actually, that I had listened to him. Because without those, they would have been completely rubbed raw. And also, I didn't listen to the part about the stick. And actually, when you look at it, and they all, have, all the old pilgrims, they have staffs. Uh, it's for support, right? Anyway, when you walk and you're going up and down, actually, the staff is quite good because it helps you. And also, you can keep pressure off certain bits of your feet. So by the second day, I'd kind of fa you know, gone into the woods, uh, and I'd taken a penknife, and I'd actually kind of cut my own staff from the trees and from the woods. So anyway, like I say, sometimes, you know, actually it's good to listen to our parents uh, or listen to our elders. There's many things that they've experienced that we can learn from. Okay, next, uh, next one. Keep things uh, in life in, your perspe in, in perspective, right? So that's Bill and Ben, the flowerpot men. Um, anyway, this was basically, uh, we were at one place and we were having a, a breakfast somewhere. And I was leaving, and Ashley was kind of uh, going to take over Twitter. Anyway, he's not very kind of uh, computer-minded. So, anyway, I was trying to set his phone up, and I was talking to Tim Reed, and every two minutes I was on this phone call, and this, Ashley was trying to talk to this kind of Christian guy. Anyway, afterwards, we were outside, and his phone rang. And I said, oh, do you want to get your phone? It's ringing. And his words were, it's my servant, not my master. And I just thought, that's so good, uh, you know, having that perspective on life, rather than just diving for it, because he was saying goodbye to us, and he didn't want to be taken away from that. Um, also, An Sang Su Chi, 
Um, they, were, they were talking to her on the news the other day, and, you know, they were saying, don't you feel, you know, uh, how do you feel, and, you know, uh, how about your suffering? Uh, do, how do you feel when people talk about your suffering? And her words were, I feel really embarrassed when you talk about my suffering. Because she said, I'm still alive. Yes, I've suffered, but I'm still alive. She said, you know, many others that started this journey with me, they're no longer living. So how can I complain when others are no longer here? Okay, next one, please. So learn from others' mistakes. Um, I'll try and run through these quite quickly. Um, But this is basically St. Bartholomew's Church uh, in Orton. And it was like a... um, They'd built like two walls... And then filled rubble in between the two walls. And actually the damp then rose through the rubble. But then on the, because of the outside was kind of lime, it actually allowed it to breathe. So as the damp went up the walls, it breathed and it dried out. But then after the war, um, it got damaged and so they had to re-render it. And they found this new material called cement. It wasn't lime plaster, so they put cement all over the outside. But of course, cement doesn't breathe like lime. Right, so the damp couldn't escape, and it went up and up and up and up and up and up, and eventually it reached the bell tower, and it rotted the whole bell tower. Uh, and then now they've got this incredible bill of about £500,000 just to do their bell tower, and they've got to re-plaster the whole thing, and then it's going to take two years for the walls to dry out. Two years. Anyway, I say learn from others' mistakes, because anyway, it saves us learning the same mistake, or making the same mistake. Anyway, in Lancaster Gate, we made the same mistake. And we plastered over the back of it with cement so that the, the lime couldn't breathe or the plaster couldn't breathe. And now it's actually added up to a huge amount of extra things. But anyway, in our spiritual lives too, people have made mistakes. It's good to learn from them. Okay, next one. Um, there are many churches uh, in the same boat as us. <laughs> wherever I went, <laughs> wherever I went, there were people struggling financially, these churches. Uh, There was one church at the top left, uh, they needed their organ refurbished. Just the organ, £70,000 for an organ. Uh, And there was like £20 a pipe. You know, if you can sponsor a pipe, £20 a pipe. Uh, This was another church, St. Catherine's, and basically their roof had gone, and it was like £300,000. And again, all these churches, they're kind of struggling. Actually, even like... uh, I think Winchester or Canterbury Cathedral, it takes about £18,500 a day to keep it open. Uh, so when I kind of put those things into you know, perspective into my life, you know, and I think about the finances in this movement, actually it kind of makes it kind of a bit more bearable. But anyway, there are many churches in the same boat as us, but actually not one person can solve those problems. Not one of those individuals in that church can fix that roof, but they can do it together. Right? And that's the, that's the message for us too, is actually if we, do it, if, if we all do a little bit, then it makes a big bit. So, you know, we need to do things together. Okay, next one, please. Almost there. Uh, don't always listen to your pastor. Uh, Simon's looking like, what's he talking about? Huh? Finish now. now, right? Okay. Anyway, like I say, we went through these, these huge apple orchards, and then someone had made this incredible carving of this snake, uh, and that was uh, the pastor in South London, Franklin Fortune, and he was like, oh, just take a bite of the apple. It's all right. Uh, you'll come to know. And then Ashley was kind of beating it away. So don't always listen. This is another one. You're probably wondering what that was. At 2 o'clock in the morning, or about 3 o'clock in the morning, Franklin was sleeping next to me on, we didn't have, a, it was just on a thin mat. That's all we had under the tree. We had no kind of tent or ground cover. And suddenly I felt like, Simon, Simon, wake up, wake up. And I was like, oh, what is it, what is it? There, there's something over there, there's something over there, it's a deer, it's a deer. And I'm like, yeah, where, where, where? I can't see anything. No, 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 it's there, it's there. Take a picture, take a picture. So anyway, I took a picture. And I said that, you know, I would have, if the flash had been and it had been a deer, it would have run away. And I'd have heard it. And I said, look, there's nothing there. Anyway, the next day, it was the same thing. It's just the tree. Uh, and somehow he thought that the tree and the shadows and the way it was, it was a deer. Uh, so he was like, take a picture, take a picture. So don't always uh, follow blindly, right? Your pastor's not always correct. Uh, mainly correct, but not always. Right, okay, next picture. Uh, these were some millennium stones at Gatton. Um, and they had, there were 12 of them. Uh, and they were set up as the 12 disciples. Uh, but anyway, I just took three of the more interesting kind of quotes from them. Uh, number one is, do not wish to be anything but what you are, and try to be that perfectly. 
Um, so, it, like I say, we're different. God made us different. Just be the best that you can be. Uh, don't try and be somebody else. The deed is all, the glory nothing. So anyway, Simon's talking also that maybe there's another tour possibly coming. And afterwards, you know, that's what you said, right? right? Maybe, possibly, who knows. Anyway, there will be one day. And afterwards, someone, you know, either there's normally someone gets praised for that. But actually, it's you guys uh, that make it happen. And actually, it's the deeds. It's the people that do the little things, right? Sometimes it, maybe we're not kind of praised at the end of it. But actually, it's you guys that make the big thing happen. So it's the small deeds that make things happen. Uh, and the soul is known by its acts. Anyway, for me, I'm kind of like a James in the Bible. Uh, and I think it's good to do things, right? Isn't it? Faith is one thing. But actually, acts are also uh, just as important. So you need to put our faith into, into practice. I'll get next picture. Um, there's some really good people out there. Uh, of course, it's a question of finding them. Um, but if you're witnessing or, or reaching out, there's some really, really good people out there. This was just in one place, in one coffee shop. That was the owner of the coffee shop uh, on the right. But he was the Christian minister that we met, that Ashley's now in contact. This was somebody else that was also walking along the Pilgrim's Way. But all of them, they made a donation. Uh, they were really inspired by what we were doing. And like I say, this guy is still in contact with Ashley, uh, and they're communicating to each other. But they were all really, really good people. But it's, like I say, it's just a question of like, trying to find those people or, or reaching out to those people. Okay, next picture. Uh, just some, last one basically, but just some antidotes. Uh, that top left-hand picture, we walked past this lady, uh, and she was in the front of her garden, and she was reading a book with a, her magnifying glass. And it looked like she looked, for all intents and purposes, like Miss Marple, right? And she was, like, reading and studying, and, you know, Miss Marple notices that things happen in, in front, and she can work it all out. Anyway, we walked past, and we were all joking, oh, it's Miss Marple in her garden. So we went back, and we were taking pictures of her over the fence, you know? And she was still reading like this. Anyway, her powers of observation are not what they used to be. She didn't even know we were there. Uh, I don't think she noticed that we'd even walked past her house. She was just too engrossed uh, in her thing. Uh, that was, the top right was a white stag. I was walking up this hill one day, and I suddenly heard these kind of hooves behind me. And I thought, oh, someone's riding a horse. Uh, and it, it's getting closer and closer to me, and I thought, oh, they'll see me in a minute. And it was getting closer and closer and closer. And suddenly I turned round and it was, this, it was this white deer stag and it, suddenly it spooked because it hadn't really seen me there. And it charged off across the field and by the time I got my camera out and everything it was kind of half gone. But anyway, I just felt at that moment it was just like, you know, God was there. Some, the white stag used to be something quite special, uh, mythical uh, in English uh, history. Also that bull in the field, I'd done about 19 miles that day and I was kind of at the end of my tether, kind of. Uh, and I was kind of like, kind of tired. And I thought, you know, anyway, but I kept, as I started walking across the field, suddenly this bull appeared. And even at 19 miles, I suddenly felt, I found energy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly I started running after 19 miles, and uh, I ran quite quickly. So even when you think you're exhausted and you can't give any more, there's always a little bit extra in the tank. And then when we got to Canterbury Cathedral, they said to us... Uh, you have to pay, actually, to go in there now because their costs are so high. But anyway, we said to them, actually, all we want to do is just pray because, actually, we walked from Winchester. And they said, oh, no, you, you've done the Pilgrim's Trail. And said, we said, yes. And they said, oh, come this way, come this way. And they took us down into the crypt uh, in the bottom where kind of other people weren't really there. And they sent the minister on duty down to us, uh, and she prayed with us. And they stamped us. You get this kind of stamp, uh, and they stamp your forehead. or They used to stamp your passport. It used to be kind of like a passport thing. But anyway, it was so nice, actually, to be kind of at the end of it, to be kind of just welcomed into them uh, like that. And they were really kind of, also, they were kind of moved uh, by, by what happened and what we'd done. Uh, last picture. And finally, under no circumstances, let me listen to that man again. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, don't let me sign up to another idea. He's already talking. Yeah, we should make it an annual trip. Uh, and maybe we can go to, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to France this time. <laughs> He's a bit of... Anyway, that was after about two days. We stopped in this pub uh, for a meal uh, in the evening because we were waiting for somebody. And within about ten minutes, he was asleep. Uh, anyway, when we came to leave and pay, I, I said, OK, can I pay? And the guy said, uh, yeah, but if you stay here any longer, 
I'm going to charge you bed and breakfast. Are your friends <laughs> like that? Um, but anyway, it was a nice pub and it was a nice thing and it was a nice trip. Anyway, I pray that uh, you can learn something uh, from some of those lessons that I learned during uh, the journey. Um, and uh, last picture. And thank you, God bless, and have a great week. Anyway, please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, thank you for being with us here during this time. We're so grateful, Father, that we could be here together, Father, as brothers and sisters. All of us, Father, are on the journey. All of us are on the path. All of us are trying to come back to being your true son and true daughter. Father, sometimes the path is difficult. Sometimes, Father, we face, Father, tribulations, hills, valleys, difficulties, Father, in our life. But the last thing that we want to do, Father, is sit down or give up. Because then, Father, we will never reach, Father, our goal. We will never come back to you. And actually, Father, the more effort and energy, Father, we put into it, and the more we do, Father, the quicker, Father, our journey can be. And we know, Father, that sometimes, Father, when we do sit down, Father, you are there, Father, willing us to get up and start again. Father, sometimes as in the footprints prayer, Father, sometimes when he looked back, he could only see one set of footprints, because at that time, Father, you carried us. Father, please be with all of us as we go along our journey. Please, Father, let us learn, Father, from each other's experiences. And let us really, Father, come together, Father, as brothers and sisters, Father, to make this, Father, a really great journey for you and for true parents. Father, I thank you for this time. I offer a report this prayer now in the name of Simon Roselli of a blessed central family. Adieu. If you like to rise, we can sing our offering song.
Let's have an offering prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to offer you this tithing and offering, and we want to thank you that we could support our true parents who are supporting you and working for your providence. You are working, Father, to save us, uh, to, to educate us and restore us and purify us and bring us back to the kingdom of heaven which you originally intended. And this money can help that, and we also give our time and energy, and we ask you to accept this. And uh, we offer you this, Father, with all our sincerity. In the name of true parents, our Jew. Thank you for coming, everyone. I hope you all have a fantastic week and a great third year of Chongi. God bless. Bye. Fireplace, a cello light in its case.